Welcome to this uh, special program, uh, collaboration between Cinema Africa and Film Rummet, a project of the Swedish Film Institute. Uh, my name is Nathan Hamelberg. I'll give a lengthier description of myself in a while. But with me tonight, uh, we have Mark A. Reed, Valerie Complex, and Katarina Hedrin. And the topic of today's discussion is diversity, inclusion, and film criticism giving the audience what they really want. Uh, so I want to have a shorter, and I hope the audience wants, a shorter description of who you are and, and what your perspectives are and, and your fields are. Uh, and then we'll go on with the discussion. So perhaps, Mark, would you start off? Yeah, I'm, um, I, I write about a film, particularly um, black film, the diaspora. And I teach at the University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida. And uh, I guess that's about it. That's a start. <laughs> yeah. Valerie? Uh, hey, I'm Valerie Complex. I am a freelance film journalist and, uh, gen uh, and writer. And I've written for Variety, The Hollywood Reporter, uh, The Playlist. IGN. I've written for a whole bunch of people. Um, and I haven't really been doing this as long as people think. I've been doing this maybe for six years. Uh, it's just something that I love to do. And inclusion is important in that. Yeah, Katerina? Uh, I'm a freelance film critic and film curator. Uh, based in South Africa, and I uh, also run uh, co-run a film club, First Wednesday Film Club in Johannesburg. I've done since two thousand and six, uh, and my focus is mainly African film and black film. Um, I write for different outlets, uh, written quite a lot for Africa as a country, the online platform uh, for FLM, a Swedish uh, film magazine, BBC Culture, and uh, yeah various platforms. Mm. Okay, I knew it already, but we have, in other words, a very competent panel. Uh, my name is Nathan, as I said, and I work as a communications officer for CELAM, which is a cultural um, organization in Sweden, also a company working with um, basically African culture in various forms, but mostly uh, music, but also film, but also uh, culture from Latin America and Asia. And um, so I guess you could say that we work with diversity or inclusion, although those very concepts are a bit dodgy. So I, I mean, I think we'll get to that, how to grasp it or so. But um, like the, the title was also giving audience what they really want. And then that obviously poses the question of they, who are they? I mean, who are the film viewers? today, uh, I would like you to, to reflect on like how has that changed? If you compare to, well, I mean, I guess everybody watches movies, but before you'd see films at the movies, I mean, in the movie theaters, whereas today we can experience film in so many, in a very private way even, and also an audience could be like you know decentralized you could have if you just look at the funding of movies that could be taking place it could be crowdfunded from all over the world from a diaspora etc do you think film in general is it more beneficial to let's say black films today than 20 years ago that's a rhetorical question well, a lot of that has to do with social media Social media, the the way information is disseminated on social media is so vast and moves so quickly um, that it's easy to make it's easier to make connections with people that you wouldn't normally have access to. Like you have access to celebrities, you can send them a message; they might get back to you, or people see your name and your connect, and they want to fund you and different things of that nature. But also like. You know, when you mention crowdfunding, that's also a part of social media culture, which has made it um, a lot more accessible, especially to 
black and brown folks to be able to create their own content mm. with their own budget and their own money that's not controlled by a studio. And there's a, since it's so much gatekeeping in this industry, mm. social media, I mean, it has its down, it, pit, it has a lot of pitfalls too, but it really has been able to open up doors for a lot of people. And a lot of that also goes into technology with the, um, with this generation and previous generations being now more technically savvy and having smartphones and stuff. And now you don't have to have a whole bunch of equipment to film a movie, a feature length film. You can use a couple of iPhones and put it on 60 P and shoot whatever you want and then find, you know, cheap editing programs. And people are doing a lot of great work with smaller budgets and less resources. So it's a lot of different com it's a lot of different uh things involved in in that. Uh, I'd like to um add um what Valerie just said. If we think of it in historical time, we think about how black and, and brown centered films were first done and usually it came out of something like independent studios or it came out of Hollywood. Uh, then you go to the spectatorship and you think about even festivals. You, I'm thinking about um, uh, the San Francisco Festival where, they, where the, um, the person discovered Melvin Van Peebles because he uh, uh, submitted his film to the festival. And uh, the guy who uh, discovered him, he's a former uh, critic of uh, Film Quarterly, an African-American man. Uh, he didn't know who Melvin Van Peebles was, but he knew about his film. Now, jump from that, you think about the beginning of Tespaco. And you think, think about all these Pan-African films, mostly African films, who, that were sh screened to an international audience that would travel to Ouagadougou just to see those films. And then with that, they returned to their prospective countries and they would end up perhaps buying the film for, for say, Japan, for probably then the Soviet Union, obviously for France and stuff, from Germany, from Sweden and stuff. And I think that that's where we have to begin with. And then we move into social media, which is very, you know, when I started school, there was no, nothing, a concept where you have your cell phone and you could shoot uh, anything that was happening and you could include that into a film or into um, like a police video of brutality or whatever. You know, just imagine if they had cell phones when the Stonewall riot happened, you know, there wouldn't be more storyline, more truth to it. And I, I agree with Valerie, what she had said, but, uh, we have to also think about, and what you began with in the question is how do the spectatorship change? And it changed right, what Valerie said, because the technology and stuff changes. And stuff. Mm. So um, yeah, that's all I have to say mm. on that subject. Mm. Uh, I would say that the, in general, there's more, more engagement, uh, both on the create, creative side, creation side, and, and the response side that, that we represent as, as curators and, um, and um, uh, critics and educators, etc. And, and uh, more engagement that not only includes black people, but also between black people. And when I say black people, I mean Biko, Biko black. Um, <laughs> as you define it, just to, to be more inclusive. Uh, and and uh, um, that engagement is facilitated through, through new platforms and new connections. And I was thinking about now when you mentioned FESPACO, for example, for many, 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 many years, FESPACO was a very, uh, in all its pan Africanness, it was a very Eurocentric affair in a way, because mm -hmm. most distributors were, were European 
money came from Europe uh, and and uh, like one very symbolic thing was that that uh, the people who traveled to Fespaco from different parts of Africa for a very long time like until the mid 2000s had to travel through Europe so from South Africa to Paris and then to Burkina Faso so, so that was quite symbolic and it was a, a biannual affair so, so I mean uh, contact was difficult and scarce and all, all, always through the intermediate like Euro, through Europe in a way and through the West in a way that that uh, cut the middleman today so. mm. well, yeah. very very interesting points from all of you and it's, it's, I hope this sets the tone because you've all added to each other I mean you laid a foundation and, and then you built on that and you know so I hope this this sticks uh, but I'm just thinking it, it's to be sort of Marxist about it, the means of production have shifted, that they've come closer to the, the people. But I would also say from a sort of, I don't know, Afrocentric or Pan-Africanist view that at least in Sweden, it's, it's like the most, I mean, growing up myself as a black kid in Sweden in the 70s and 80s, the huge difference today is that we have some kind of, we have a kind of black intelligentsia in Sweden that is that ha takes discussions in South Africa or in Atlanta or in like I don't know Brixton or whatever as their natural like frame of reference so there's a kind of creolish culture discussing that doesn't really have that much regard for for borders so that obviously plays into how we see films, at least how we disseminate films, I guess. Um, yes. Yeah, come. No, and one thing uh, with regards to what you're saying, so, so one thing that also you get away with, like do away with, um, is the gatekeepers. <laughs> the, mm. I, mean, I grew up black in Sweden, so I know the, the gatekeepers in Sweden. And, and again, those are also made um, su superfluous. We don't mm. need them to communicate about certain things to different. Mm. That's yeah. true. But the, That's th the, thing, the thing that I, uh, in response to Katrina, what she said, is, and I, I agree with that, you know, um, basically I'm a Marxist, a black Marxist. I'm a feminist, but I'm a womanist. Um, but I learned through books and documents that were by Europeans. Uh, most of the time until I got to Audre Lorde or these others. Uh, I would say that you wouldn't have a Med Hondo, you wouldn't have a Ali Jarima who has his own production thing if it wasn't through some source that would he, he made money, he had to get money from Germany um, uh, these uh, uh, and Usman Semben, hmm. he was educated in Russia and the Soviet Union, and his first and black girl, the Noir de, what if you look at the credits, it was funded by Russia and and also he created his own company. Now um, I'd like to jump you know, through uh, history. I, in fact, I wish we could jump through another history and not have who we have as <laughs> our president. Well, he's not my president, but is the president. You know, but there, there has to be st struggles and we have to do acknowledge some of the unfortunate white angels, you know, that, uh, that perhaps helped us you know, and stuff, and, or, or we're just uh, creating a history that's, uh, that um, maybe, I don't know, I, I like to imagine history like that, but it's not uh, like that, though. Mm -hmm. And I, I really agree with you, Katharina. I know, come, when I was, used to go to Fispaco, I used to see all these well, I'm not going to say that because this is going to be. I used to see all these French, and the French would almost choose the films that were awarded. 
you know. And then you have people like Med Hondo and Ali Jarima. He would even attack the Senegalese filmmakers who had taken the money that, that didn't belong to them but belonged to the collective, you know. I, I like those people, those types of filmmakers that have a conscience and a sense of ethics. And it's not just about black skin, it's about where your heart is and where your soul is in yeah. reference to the community, the collective and stuff. So, you know, and I, and I know that South, you aren't, you aren't, you're Swedish, right? Katrina, or are you South Africa? Swedish. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, you're yeah. in South Africa, and but they I mean, have a nice history, blacks in South Africa who were filmmakers and, uh, or documentarians who left that country during the, a certain time and lived in, say, England and stuff. And there's certain things we go through to probably having to um, gain our freedom. And change. I, I can I say something so. there? Pardon? I, I, can I say something? I just comment on yeah. that. I rarely, I mean, I'm not the type of person that is prone to any kind of sentiment that would be, could be labeled as national pride of any sort. But mm -hmm. there's one thing that I'm very grateful for, and that is that, you know, unofficially, the, the ANCs, like, exile headquarters during the apartheid era it was for a long time it was stockholm in sweden and mm -hmm. like the amount of uh south african and namibian and angolan Botswanian, Zambian intellectuals in sweden was huge so i think that's very much like many intellectual and, and political exiles from uh, from uh, uh Southern Africa, from Africa in general, um, they had Sweden as a, as a place. The problem is obviously then that they weren't given a lot of space in Sweden. But if you were black, they could actually, um, they, they made culture relevant for black people in, a, in many ways. Um, Valerie, I, I want to ask you, um, a lot of times we hear that group so-and-so is never given any space in film or these stories are never told in movies. And I mean, we've sort of said that that's not totally true today, but if you look at mainstream film, like mainstream Hollywood film, what do you see today are the changes when it comes to diversity and inclusion compared to um, say 20 years ago? First, I wanted to address something really quick that, um, that Dr. Reed mentioned, which is um, when you get like, especially in America, something that I noticed is, especially when I, you know, explore a lot of films um, from the black diaspora that came from the eighties and the early nineties, um, not all, but there are a lot of films that were funded by major studios. And when, when, I, watched, when I watched them as a child, you know, they made an impact on me, but when I watch them now, I'm like, okay, yeah, so right. this was filmed for, for the white gays and not for the diaspora. I don't know if this makes sense, but what I'm saying is there are certain films that when white people watch them, you know, it makes them feel good and comfortable. And those are the films that tend to get the funding or used to get the funding. I don't know if I'm making sense, but, um, but when I think about um, big budget studios and gatekeepers and struggles, I think about Usain Palsy and the dry oh, white season yeah, yeah. and how um, she had been trying to get this movie made for a while and you know, studios were just sort of not interested in giving a black woman a chance to direct a film and everything and she was able to bring Marlon Brando out of retirement and um, he was nominated for an Oscar and everything and it was like a major milestone because I believe she was the first black woman who was able to get funding from a major studio for his first black director. I could be wrong. Um, no, you write feature length film. She's the first black woman. And she, and she talks, you know, and I met her at TIFF last year and she talked about 
like some of the struggles and some of the gatekeeping that she experienced with a major studio. Um, because it's even more difficult to have agency over your story when there's so many people with hanging money over your head mm. and they're going to want it the way that they want it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and not the way that you see it. And that's how, um, and that's why inclusion is important, not just like for people in front of the screen, but behind the screen and people with the money. And now you see various production companies run by, run for, and you know, run by black folks who produce content that is for black people. And um, inclusion is important. So it's sort of like a cycle because there needs to be uh, an inclusive number of writers and film critics who are writing about the film. Because right now, film criticism, the old way is sort of dead. People are not just writing about films just to say, okay, I'm just gonna talk about this film. People are analyzing films and talking about its social impact, if it has one. Um, and you know that gets a lot of complaints from the gatekeepers that are like, oh, yeah. okay, well, people are taking it too seriously or thinking about it too emotionally. And it's like, no, you just can't identify with the film and that's not my problem. That's it's your like, problem. It's like, you know, how would you even watch, like, uh, Get Out uh -huh. without saying something about right. symbolism? Or how Besides would you saying, watch, oh, it's a great watch, movie. Watchmen or something. But I got an example. Uh -huh. Like, a bunch of years ago, uh, a Swedish Chilean uh, director, Daniel Espinosa, made his film called Safe House that takes place in, in South Africa. And basically, the, the studio, they were trying to roll him and say, could you have, could you put like a white dude in the script? So, you know, so we have some Kevin Costner and Dances with Wolves kind of story. Mm -hmm. And, but he had already also hooked up Denzel Washington. And Denzel Washington got behind Daniel and said, no, this is about South Africa. How the hell are you gonna, we're not gonna have a fantasy movie in that way. And I think that's, that kind of solidarity to sort of, if you're gonna to stick to your guns, you have to have people with some clout behind you and mobilize that. But see, the thing about the clout is like, so, and I realized this, for the last two years, I really realized this, that the system is so white centric that talent doesn't really, doesn't always notice because they're so used to that environment. They don't notice that it's lacking. And um, I think at the Emmys last year, there was a, a reporter in the press room after Sterling K. Brown won his Emmy for um, This Is Us, Jalissa Lachey, that's her name. And she asked, she was like, well, how do you, you know, feel about the new inclusive uh, initiatives that have been coming up? And you look around this room and you see only one type of person and he was like, wow, I never noticed that. And it's like, well, you are in, you are in these spaces and you still, they are so white centric that you're just like used to it. It's like, you don't see anything else. And right now people are fostering the environment that not only is inclusion necessary, but we will not accept anything else. And another good thing about social media is people can be loud and they get heard and studios actually make changes based on that. Um, but also like coming from the critics perspective, um, it's just more interesting to read when people want to know about the latest film that, that came out, they're not going to read variety for that. They want to know what I think. Mm. They want to know what you think and you and you and you. Um, and I think that's where a lot of these large outlets and these studios are missing the point. And they're like, oh, you know, we know that blacks and Latinos go to the movies. It's like, you know that now because now there's statistics. But before it was like, they were acting like we never went to the movies before un until 2018. So um, I hope that answers your question. I'm sorry. I was yeah. getting mad and going on a rant. <laughs> I mean, you wanted to comment. No, I, I was thinking about what's, um, because I, 
I mean, what, what I am interested in and what I want to see is, is like um, the freedom of engagement and, and to engage in whatever way, however you want to, on your own terms and conditions and according to your own interests and, and, and orientations. So uh, I'm not necessarily looking for a, a, a separatist way of being and engaging uh, because I think it, it is a mind question but I, what I'm like I'm, I'm more interested in engagements that are free from having to please anyone who is used to be in the center for example so, so, so to recenter which means decenter in many ways but then center in ways that that also where we can surprise ourselves and um, for example I I'm very scared of um, that's exaggerated, but but I, I'm I'm wary of also in 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 the reaction against something that one starts to be prescriptive and and looking for ideal ways of um, like there's a black way of engaging with cinema, there's a black way of making cinema. For me, that that doesn't really matter. That that's not the issue. I want the not every black person is a Marxist. Um, and if, if a black person has a, the most superficial take on get out without the political implications, by all means, you know, like, um, it's just no, that I, I, mean, I, I want the process and I want the approach, the freedom of engagement is what I'm- You want the, the, the filmmaker, whoever the creative artist is, is to have the freedom to speak have their voice without being uh, like um, I might. This is might say the wrong thing, but negative, where you know, or not just reaction. Yeah, or authenticity. As, as I said, I could. Yeah. I I want to ask. I mean, you said white centric. I mean, I I can totally sort of uh, I can agree with that. But I would also say rather uh, another way of saying it. I guess is that. Um, mainstream movies, Hollywood movies, they are based on a sort of lack of double consciousness. So if you take that like Dubois uh, concept that black people always have been able to sort of have yeah. identify from various sites. I mean, black people don't dislike white movies. That's black and Latino and whatever have seen all kinds of movies. People all over the world have seen movies with white protagonists, white antagonists, sometimes antagonists of color, whatever. The thing is when you see everything from like new Star Wars movies or whatever, you see these whole like net troll armies just because protagonist for once is a Nigerian British actor or it's a woman. Ah, or yeah. And I want, I want everything, <laughs> if you understand what I mean. But in, in a way, that's our superpower, right? Uh, and the, which can also be our greatest weakness. <laughs> uh, yeah. that, that we, I mean, I'm, I'm super happy that I'm uh, able to identify with a white, uh, straight, uh, cis, uh, gender American man. Like, I'm super happy because I really can. I can, I can feel him as a human being. Uh, if that person cannot feel me, that's actually... It's so very, very, very bad for him. But the question, the, the problem is uh, then when we start to to unsee each other because we know that they, uh, there are people out there who don't see us, and then because that is the norm that 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 we adopt that view and look. I mean, to acknowledge that we are unseen, again, like, like, like as black people and black um, in film, that we are in many ways and have, have historically been unseen, it's very important to make that point and have that consciousness without unseeing ourselves in the process. And, and for me, part of that unseeing is to always react in opposition, for example, to always mm -hmm. act as if someone is looking and will judge. Um, be mm -hmm. Again, because that's hampering the, the, the freedom of engagement. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I would like to- I'm a, little un I'm a little unclear still on what you mean, because I'm, when, I, when you say freedom of engagement, I'm thinking that that means, um, various interpretations should be allowed on a specific thing. But I don't know if I'm reading what you're saying properly. Can I get another example? 
No, uh, freedom of engagement is, is both in the creation and in the reading and, and engaging with them. So, so, so uh, I'm not sure I understood the question, but, but more non-prescriptive. <laughs> I'm, I'm, very, I'm, I'm very afraid of non-prescriptive okay. ways. Uh, to be as banal as one wants to, to be, to address racism if one wants to, but also don't give a shit about racism because one doesn't have time for that because I'm talking about being a, like a, on a completely human being level where racism might be an aspect of it, but there are also other parts because sometimes we also engage in, in, in context where that's not the main problem, but where I am a human being, where I am someone's lover, friend, uh, something else, not not always see each other. So I, if I repeat again, not I always. Okay, I, got you. I, I, I think another, another way of putting it also, I mean, I hear you, if we're talking about some kind of authorship or, you know, just as a film creator, you should, but also as an audience, you should be able to engage in a story on any level you like. And you could also tell what kind of story you would like. But I think one problem with that kind of, that you said, Mark, I don't know, some type of negritude, reactive way of looking at identity is that you could almost sort of become hostage to a kind of aggrandized tokenism that you sort of, you, 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 you're happy about the token spot, but you want to expand it. And where I, I would like nuance. And this uh, a Swedish former uh, consultant at the Swedish Film Institute, Baker Karin, he said, he expressed it really like poignantly, nuance is the privilege of the norm. To be able to be nuanced or to be able to be, be represented in a nuanced way. And when it comes to that in Sweden, I don't know if this applies to the US or, or definitely in many ways does not apply to say Nollywood, but Sweden has some huge infantile disorders in regard to identity. And I think a part of this stems from that representation as a word means quite different things. And we confuse them on one level, on a political level, representation is like a mandate. You know, I've, I've been elected to represent these people. But on, in, an artistic, in an artistic discourse, it's more to be representation is approximation, to give form, to, you know, uh, to give depth. And black people, I mean, blackness is the, the like, um, it's the mirror of whiteness in Hollywood. I mean, they even, you know, invented blackness in, in minstrel form to have something to complement whiteness. So we don't need more blackness. We want deeper or, or more nuanced blackness, if you like what I mean. It's not like, you know, the racism isn't upheld historically in Hollywood movie through some brutal exclusion of black people. It's by like a kind of fake, fantastic blackness where black people could be the bully or the, the you know, the stormtrooper that has to be killed for the heroes to save the day or whatever, or the, the rapist or something. We don't need more of that blackness. We need nuance. And that obviously goes for... for not only black people, people of color in general. But I also think with, with this whole, I mean, um, double consciousness. Dubois expanded on that like in 1903, like before there was Hollywood movie, but the whole concept that black people had to view themselves both, you know, by themselves, but also in the view of the rest of society. I think that applies to most of the world in regards to Hollywood movies that they have to be able to identify with protagonists who represent people who wouldn't identify with them. So there's a, what do you call it? It's like a asymmetrical relationship. But is, isn't there a huge difference there between black African film and black mm -hmm. American film? Or? Katarina, what would you say? Well, it's funny because... Uh, uh, I just um, wrote a thing for um, for FLM about um, uh, about this year's selection, um, Cinema Africa selection, uh, wh where I commented on, um, which makes complete sense. Obviously, there, there are a lot of American films uh, and a lot of films that that like. Uh, 
address uh, uh, Black Lives Matter and, and to that, that, that response, uh, that, that uh, response to the current situation, obviously. Uh, but there's a difference, and, and I really appreciate that and understand that, but there's also, I think again, so, sorry for, uh, I have a tendency to repeat myself and quote myself, but again, uh, be mindful of not always um, uh, react again as, as if someone is looking and that to be reminded of like, like um, to always, uh, I mean, because there are also a lot of uh, films from Africa by Africans or Africans in other parts of the world where, where, where be, where a black experience is not always uh, in relation to racism and in relation to a white case and in, and, 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 and in this double consciousness situation that you're talking about. So, so to, I think it's very important that both are, that both aspects are there. And, um, and I mean, not even every black American film deals with racism. Uh, I mean, even if it's a, it, it's a premise but it's not always in conversation straight. It's, it's the premise, not, not the, the main story. Not, not, the, not the, yeah. Mm. And, Valerie and Mark, how would you, oh, any comments? No. Yeah, I, I was going to say in support of what Katrina said, I think the most uh, poignant recent films have been made is by Barry Jenkins. And his is not so much about racism, it's about the community. And he deconstructs all these images of what blackness and black subjectivity is in how he cast the roles and stuff. In uh, Medicine for Melancholy, you have a, a black woman and a black guy, they're both in San Francisco, they meet for one night, and you know they have a relationship but the black woman her blackness is not the same as this guy's blackness and he's constantly talking about uh, where are the blacks in san francisco which is interesting and it's uh, very important but she just doesn't identify with that and it's and it's not that she doesn't identify with her race she just doesn't have that type of feeling you know, and in fact, she's uh, she's has a relationship with a white guy, but that's not even part of the story except for it's mentioned. Then you have the other Barry Jenkins film that we won the Academy Award, and he deconstructs black male uh, dope dealers, and that was uh, the most impressive image that you could ever see in mainstream film and stuff and think about the mother the mother son relationship and the surrogates you know i i agree with katrina that we don't have to ha always be um talking about race is the problem but in the united states race is the problem mm. and that's why black lives matter just burst, and then you see it connecting to a lot of struggles, to the struggle with the Palestinian people, to the, all these other struggles. And that's not just about blacks. Yeah. It connects to trans movements. You know, that's what's important. And about this, um, this festival, I looked through the scene of the film, I was really, uh, First, surprise and happy, they have a queer section in this. And it's people of color queer, which is very important. So, that's uh, well, um, I think, um, now I see what everybody is saying. And to talk about why Barry Jenkins and what he does is so nuanced and important is because yeah. we know that in the worlds that he's created in his last three movies, racism is there. Yeah. But there's also other things that people are dealing with within that. So with Moonlight, we know that there's an issue with mass incarcerations and, and but it also is a film that hit, talks about queerness and masculinity and growing up. 
and existing under the umbrella of racism. The same thing with um, if Beale Street can talk. Uh -huh. At this core, it's a love story, but it also involves, it also exists under the umbrella of racism. But it's not a film about racism. It's a film about yeah, this couple it. that exists under racism. And one of the other films that comes to mind is Jordan Peele's Us, uh -huh. which is about a black middle class family. And in essence, it's what somebody had called, and I liked it, they called it a Marxist horror movie, you which, is <laughs> which is essentially, because Us is essentially a film about the haves and the have nots. But you have this black family that's pretty upper middle class. And we know that racism, racism exists, but this film is about class war. And there's so many different, we, and I, now that I see your point, I agree that we have to be allowed to be more nuanced in that situation. Like I think, I think they, that, Black films should allow should be allowed to be bad because so many films starring white folks are horrible. Mm -hmm. That should be normalized within the POC community as well. Um, really, really good black antagonists, and I'm not just talking about you know the movie Superfly with drug dealers or whatever, which is a great movie still. But I saw a movie recently by a new director, Teresha Poe, called Sela and the Spades. Hmm. And it documents the history of this black high schooler who's a sociopath. And it's not, it's unlike anything I've ever seen before. Like we know racism exists at this school, but you see this person, this black woman going on and just manipulating everybody and just causing all this chaos. And it's like, you see that in a lot of films, you know, with young uh, white women who are um, antagonists, but I've never seen that in a film. Hmm. With a black, with a black young girl, again, us is the same thing. Where it's like you rarely see horror films that feature creepy black children. That should be allowed too. Yeah, but because children are creepy sometimes. I um, think, I think with, with with that in mind, I mean, uh, Ilva Habel, a Swedish uh, a sister who's um, yeah film scholar, but she said also, I think weighs in here that when we are very starved of representations of us, we are sort of proportionately sensitive of the character of these depictions. And when, once we have a kind of wealth of depictions, we could have like a serial killer black kid and be laughing about it almost. But once we have just like very monolithic representations, caricatures, stereotypes, and so on, that then we are sensitive because they carry a lot of weight. And I think that with Bear Jenkins' uh, Moonlight, I mean, the fact that he made a film that to me was about intimacy, trust, uh, and, uh, and violence, and how it affects black men. But I mean, most not even if you weren't black, I guess you would see those things in yourself and how much, how, how threatening violence is or how much you long for, for trust. And also, I mean, intimacy was not first and foremost sexual, I think. It was first and foremost, like a kind of affinity and stuff. When you see that, then obviously you see the humanity. And if you previously were seeing people as the other, then you see them as yourself. So, I mean, it's therapeutic. And it's nice to see ourselves as somebody that anyone that can see as themselves. Yeah, Katarina. Yeah, no, just to, to, to add, uh, because of what you said, Valerie, and what you, what you continue to expand on, on uh, Nathan, uh, is that um, if I go way back uh, in time, like, like, for example, what, what made, um, I mean, the, I revisited the film in, in many aspects, um, 12 Years a Slave, but what made that film so uh, revolutionary in a way was that for the first time we saw an as, enslaved person who who had been robbed we understood what he had been robbed of something like we knew he was free we knew he had a family he had life he had aspirations etc before that we had only seen enslaved person people who had always been enslaved and and almost it's very hard to 
to identify with that and to feel that, like when, when you've been robbed of something that you never had, it's very hard to engage. And I, I was thinking about like the Breonna Taylor, um, what happened to her? Like one thing that really, like that keeps, uh, when I think of her, I think of that, that how, how the last evening has been described, that he, she and her boyfriend, they decided to have a pizza, they were going to watch a movie, and they did that, and then they went to bed together, and then this happened. And for me, it's like, it kills me to think of that beautiful evening that we all had, we all had them, we all that mm. that's normal life and and that in 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 that context it becomes so like the 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 horror of it is is emphasized by that ordinary loving little life that goes on and is so brutally that's the robbery and that's and i so so just to emphasize that's the part that kills me that really gets to me the pizza and the loving evening and then that, and I without that, it would be a one more thing. To me, is is that um, sometimes I get the feeling that it's so it's so very hard for, and I, I guess I'm speculating here, but I so often when I read film critics, white film critics, write about. I thought about it when when the re boot of uh, Roots came because you know I, I really thought about Roots and compared it to 12 Years a Slave. Roots is essentially a happy series but I mean I think the first version of I mean I saw it as a really small kid but just because it came during the bicentennial people were like why do you have to bring this up but it's basically saying well, America is going, it's, it's going in the right direction, sort of. But most white people, this is terrible, but, you know. And but, to me, it's, like, it's, it's somehow, it's like a story about, you know, survival and, you know, towards a better union or something. <laughs> just but, to, but, to, those kind of films, I was thinking, like, one thing that always also, like, to understand that what made, like, it's... Uh, films about slavery before have been so extremely focused on the on the perverse violence like you need the whipping orgy to understand that that slavery is bad as if the fact that people are owned is not bad enough i don't need to see blood i don't need to see whips i don't need to see scars people were bought and sold enough like uh, mm -hmm. enough the blood and the gore and the, i'm not saying that that i mean that's horrifying and that should be noted down in history as a crime and there should be reparations that all that i'm not pissing over it but it shouldn't have to be so pornographic every time to emphasize how horrible mm -hmm. it was people were old end of story that was ew, horrible horrible mm -hmm. horrible um cassie lemons um harriet kind of reminds me a little bit of what you said, because the film, aside from a couple of scenes, wasn't all that violent. And, and I know that was a complaint of a couple of Black critics. It was like, well, it seemed unrealistic. I was like, well, do you really need whips and, and, and chains and people being noosed and hung from the tree to know that slavery is bad? Um, or to know that she had a hard time during slavery, like I, I you know, and so that's that's where I kind of saw it from. There are other, there are still other perspectives. Like um, a friend of mine, uh, Robert uh, Jones, he has a a book coming out called Prophets, and it's actually about a queer relationship during slavery. And I'm like, I never thought about that. Because we don't, you know, that's not something that we get. But yes, I'm sure there were queer folks during slavery too, and all types of other folks. We just keep seeing the same thing, especially when it's like, we call it the slavery genre now, because that's just kind of what it is at this point. Um, but you have your, you know, like you were saying, you have your outliers, but there aren't many. Um, and a lot of these films come from, the white gaze, I don't know, that's just, I don't know. That's 
how I feel. Um, I think a friend of mine, Thomas, um, he lives in the U.S. He's he's, uh, yeah, he's gay and he's uh, very smart. <laughs> but we we you know we went out for long nights going on bars and we were talking about you know because we meet so rarely because he lives in the state. But we talked about we compared how in uh, Brokeback Mountain how mm -hmm. this is a gay couple. That's like the thing. It's not a love. I mean, yeah, it is love, but it's it's sort of it's like amazing. And we compared to like. If you take the wire, you have the series. You have a bunch of um, really like the most likable and hateable characters are gay, but that's not the main thing about them. It's a, it's sort of not commented. It's just you know they just they are that, and that's that's I think again it's a kind of maturity thing. Where when do you when are you allowed to the depict uh, that kind of complexi complexity? Well, when, when I think about like, especially in queer cinema, something that came up recently, literally last month, um, is there's been a release of lesbian films that have come out within the last two to three years. Um, and a lot of them, as they feature white women, um, and a lot of them are, are love, you know, are love stories, uh, that take place over time and do you know they like dramas but then mm -hmm. you have a film like Rafiki that comes out and it's all of this trauma there's all of this stuff and they're trying to keep their relationship secret and it's just something that we know is you know as some you know a lot of us are queer and film critics too like myself and we notice that it's something within the genre where I like Rafiki don't get me wrong I really like the film but when it comes to that type of cinema, queer cinema, there's always tragedy and trauma and the characters aren't allowed to exist. This trauma makes up the character and the story and who they are and the love affair as opposed to, okay, well, we have two people who have experienced trauma, but this is a love story. I don't know if that makes sense, but it, it, mm. it has come up recently, actually. Mm. Well, what do you think about, I'm not I'm going to forget her name, but she's, um, she's a um, queer black uh, filmmaker. She's one of the most, uh, she taught us. You talking about Reese? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Her, her, that, um, that particular film that she did, I, see, I can't remember the, even the Pariah. Time. Yeah. It's one of my favorites, yeah. That, that has, uh. Uh, nuances it, and the father in that film you know it's almost like uh, moon, moonlight and this the surrogate father that he has and I, I thought that was a beautiful film yeah I love Pariah How much, okay so I mean I just mentioned the wire but never mind that particular series but how much do you think of all this change I mean, I, th I think a lot of times, uh, like um, HBO series are like, you know, oh, yeah. they're like uh, probes because so much of, I think this whole white gaze or not white, but the white protagonist and so on. I think it comes from this very conflict driven narrative where you have 90 or 120 minutes to go from start to resolution you're gonna have the bad dude and you're gonna have the good dude so i, I mean how, how much have tv series changed that and opened up for more diverse film would you say it has changed but i was thinking to link that also with with uh, if that was part of the uh, title of this conversation is like to give audiences what they want and I was thinking about the what you talked about the the wire where you have the queer characters who who happen to be queer rather than being queer characters uh, and now also like how, how tv series uh, are pushing boundaries which they definitely are because they're just much more wiggle room and much more opportunities and 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 will to to experiment but I was thinking about the trick is isn't it for me at least, is to, to not give audiences what they want, because how, how do you gauge that even? But to give audiences to, to, to 
to give audience what they could not imagine that they wanted, what they haven't seen before, mm -hmm. like, like to, to, to open up for new imaginations, both on the creative side and on the receiver side. Uh, I think. And, and I think that bravery we see on these platforms, on these uh, HBO, Netflix, et cetera, in a way that we haven't seen on the big screen, on the exclusive big screen before. Television has been amazing, especially for dark-skinned women. Annalise Keating is probably one of the best <laughs> female characters in TV history. Yeah. And she just happens to be a black woman. And we and people like me love Annalise Keating because she's an abject psychopath. And not that I love that aspect of her, but it's something that I have not seen outside of a black woman being a crackhead or being, excuse me, being on drugs in a film. She, you know, she's an upper middle class woman. She's highly educated. She's calculated. She's nasty, but also she like looks out for her friends. So it's like there's a duality there that I think is very human. Um, and it was like, you know, Shonda Rhimes came up with that. And That's, I was like, wow, yeah. you gave that to That's a black it. woman? Amazing. That's it. Um, you know, with the Watchmen and Regina, Regina King and what she did on that. We, you know, we have yet, she's like the first, she's like the, one of the very first black, dark-skinned superheroes that we've seen on television. Mm. Um, and is, and the show, the whole show is just like nuanced and what is important in terms of inclusion for the Watchmen specifically is, um, Linda Hoff, who, who, who was a showrunner, actually listened to input from Black women specifically mm -hmm. on how to navigate the show. And that's why it made such an impact with the Black community and with communities of color. Because everyone is represented in the watch. And I think, yeah, I think um, we're almost at the full stop. So I think well, there's time for one more, more comment from each and one of you, but I just wanted to make one point. I remember when I was young, I was studying film, we, we read uh, Laura Mulvey, mm -hmm. uh, visual pleasure narrative, narrative cinema. And, and she, she makes some kind of very Freudian and Lacanian point about like you, you're subsumed into the white gaze and you lose sense of yourself when you're in the, <laughs> in the darkness, like dreamlike and so on. And I'm like, what? movie theater did she go to? If I go to the movies, I hear somebody laughing at an awkward space and I think, oh, these people are so and so. I'm, I'm probably never as aware of who I am and where I am as when I'm in a movie theater. And, and now we're taken away from that when we watch movies more in isolation. But as we've talked about before, the discussion and the dissemination of movies goes on on social media and it goes on forever. And I think even more you could say that films much a much higher degree in dialogue with each other, that there's like an ongoing conversation. Uh, so I would say like, what are your hopes for? Like, what's the next step, if you like? Who's, what's the next barrier? I mean, that's a bit blunt, but what's the next thing, you know? And I don't mean the next trend, but like, if you could finish with that. <laughs> well, I can say one thing and then everybody, I think that um, we need more, not so much the way that he makes films and produces them, but I think we need more people like Tyler P Perry, who don't depend on um, Hollywood, who creates their own studio complexes, and you have to have money to do that. And um, th that's it, and I think that uh, some of these actors who are making all this money and stuff, they could end up getting together and doing that. Like United Artists became, uh, was done with actors who were, wanted to be independent of the uh, mainstream movies and stuff, and they, uh, they were able to do, accomplish that. I think uh, there's enough um, cultural capital now and also financial capital that I think black and brown people can do it. Valerie? I, I think we just need, um, we need to, a lot more, I, I would hope a lot more normalization goes on. Um, a lot of people don't like Tyler Perry movies, but I think that should be allowed. 
he should be allowed to make what he wants um because he knows his demographic and there are people who like it um i would like to see more representation across genre um not just action and dra drama i want to see more si more people of color black folks in sci-fi uh superhero films and westerns just more because we the only way to learn how to navigate these characters and give them nuance is to put them in the situation and see how it works out gauge the gauge the audience reaction and the story reaction and see how that goes i just hope that there's more introspection into how inclusivity can affect people across various aspects of, of the industry from film criticism to directing katarina yeah, the same. I mean, uh, and, and also uh, uh, more diversity in terms of, uh, I mean, uh, not only race, but, but uh, orientation like trans. I, I don't know many transgender filmmakers out there, but I, I, I wouldn't be able to name one now, I think. Um, uh, um, filmmakers living with disability stories that that the where that is a premise but not the story etc and i i mean i do uh, i do feel that what what tv and this new landscape scape has done is amazing and uh, if if the prize for for a continuation in this direction and again i don't even want to imagine because i want to be surprised because i think that is possible i think we can't even imagine what we're going to be able to imagine um and i want to leave it open for that but if the price for all this to continue is bye bye to the big screen i'm perfectly fine with that mm. katarina i wanted to ask you a question you mentioned before about um i lost my train of thought i'm sorry <laughs> sorry <laughs> It was a good we question. A too. thousand trains of thought that we, we should pursue. Uh, I really hope we could do this again and hopefully invite more voices. Uh, but it's been really great to have the discussion. Um, well, goodbye for now. Uh, see you all again, I hope. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks for having me. All of you. <laughs>